Shall I start? Namaste and greetings. I, Zubia Moin, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Dili, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we are gathered for a panel discussion on the topic, domestic violence and abuse, challenges and responses. This deliberation is a part of the State of Gender Equality hashtag gender gap series organized by the IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center. As the chair for the session, we have Professor Vibhuti Patel, Visiting Hello, Distinguished nice. Professor at IMPRI. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. We, with permission of the chair, I would like to introduce the gathering. Yeah, please introduce the panelists. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. We are elated to welcome the esteemed panelists for today's panel discussion on the very important topic. Advocate Gayatri Sharma, Lawyer and Program Director, Women Power Connect, New Delhi. We welcome you, ma'am. Professor Vijay Lakshmi Brara, Department of Sociology, Royal Global University, Guwahati. We welcome you, ma'am. We also welcome Dr. Tara Nair, Director, Research and Knowledge, Center for Migration and Labor Solutions, Ajivika Bureau. Advocate Selin Thomas, Advocate Selin Thomas, Thomas and Associates, Bengaluru. Dr. Kirti Bolineni, President, Vasavya Mahila Mandali, Vijayawada. And finally, Anchita Ghata, co-founder Parichiti, Making Women Visible, Kolkata. We welcome you all. Now, I would like to invite our chair, Professor Vibhuti Patel, ma'am, to initiate the deliberation with her opening remarks and to proceed further with the discussion. We look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Zubia. And first of all, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Arjun Kumar and Zubia for uh, galvanizing all of us into action about this very important subject of domestic violence and abuse, challenges and responses. And I greet the panelists, Advocate Gayatri Sharma, Professor Vijaya Lakshmi Brara, Dr. Tara Nair, Advocate Selim Thomas, Dr. Kirti Bolineni, and uh, Achita uh, Kata. Uh, and dear participants. Uh, domestic violence is a violation of women's rights to physical integrity, to liberty, and all too often to her right to life itself. Uh, when states and societies fail to take basic steps needed to protect women from domestic violence or allow these crimes to be committed with impunity, states are failing in their obligation to protect women from this torture. And we have seen it on a big, large scale. Domestic violence happened during these two years of pandemic. What are the signs of domestic violence? Destructive criticism and verbal abuse, shouting, mocking, accusing, name calling, verbally threatening, pressure tactics, sulking, threatening to withdraw, withhold money, disconnect the telephone, take the car away, commit to suicide, take children away, report you to welfare agencies unless you comply with his demands regarding bringing up the children, lying to friends, family, uh, and lying to your family's uh, members, telling you that you have no choice in the, any decision, or being disrespectful, persistently putting you down in front of uh, other people, not listening or responding to when you talk, interrupting your telephone calls. Licking, uh, taking money from your purse without asking, refusing to help uh, in child, with child care or housework, breaking trust, continuously lying to you, withholding information from you, being jealous, uh, gaslighting, having other relationships, breaking promises uh, and breaking shared agreements, isolating you. So social isolation was a major reason why domestic violence took place in such a great uh, uh, extent because the victim was in the proximity of, of the tormentor because the, during the lockdown, uh, there was no other recourse which the victim would take or where, where nobody would even intervene. Uh, harassment following you, checking up your uh, on you, opening your mail, repeatedly checking to see who was there talking to you on phone or embarrassing you in public, and the threats, making angry gestures, using physical size to intimidate, shouting you down, 
destroying your positions, breaking things, punching walls, building a knife or a gun, and threatening to kill or harm you or children, and also sexual violence, using force, threat, intimidation to make you perform sexual acts, having sex with you when you don't want to have sex, or any degrading demands or degrading treatment based on sexual orientation, and also physical violence, such as punching, slapping, hitting, beating, biting, uh, kicking, pulling your hair, pushing, showing, burning, and strangling, and the denial, saying the abuse doesn't did not happen whenever the police or the relatives or neighbors, they, they interrogate, saying you caused the abusive behavior, uh, being publicly gentle and patient and crying and begging for forgiveness and saying it will never happen again, but still it happens. So in response to this kind of reports, which came, uh, which were made, to the newly formed women's organizations, they became very, the domestic violence became a very important public concern for the women's movement. And in 1983, domestic violence was recognized as a specific criminal offense by introduction of section 498A into the Indian Penal Code. And this section deals with cruelty by husband or his family towards a married woman. And the four types of cruelty were uh, included, conduct that is likely to drive a woman to suicide, conduct which is likely to cause grave injury to the life and limb and health of women, and harassment with the purpose of forcing the woman and her relatives to give some property, or harassment because the woman or her relatives are unable to yield to the demands for money or not or, or some part of the property. So domestic violence as NFHS rounds on NFHS 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, which was conducted during the pandemic, they say that it is a common form of violence and it is called intimate partner abuse, battering, wife meeting, defined as an ongoing experience of physical, emotional, financial, and sexual abuse faced by women within the household. It is characterized by long-term pattern of abusive behavior and uh, control. The abusers uh, could, could be a woman's husband or other members of the natural or marital family. Domestic violence is not specific to any culture or community. It cuts across boundaries of class, caste, religion, race, ethnicity, and nation. It is rooted in a social, economic, political, and cultural structures that place women in unequal and vulnerable position. As this violence takes place within the home, quote unquote, home, private domain. It is considered a personal and private matter, not a serious public health issue. But because now we see that both it is a very important public health concern, so that we have most of the one-stop crisis centers, which have come up in last 22 years, they are located in the casualty ward of the hospital because the physical injury that a, 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 a victim or a survivor of violence faces. Uh, while uh, uniform national prevalence rate for domestic violence do not exist. We see that there is a variation in the different states and recently also the NFHS uh, 5 has shown that nearly one third of the women have reported that they have, fought, they have faced uh, either verbal or psychological or emotional or physical or economic or sexual violence in the domestic arena. And that's why it has become a very important concern uh, for the uh, uh, human rights movement, women's rights movement, feminist movement. And even recently we concluded 15 days of activism against violence against women. So it is in this context that today we have organized this panel discussion and we have uh, luminaries and experienced practitioners as well as uh, uh, public intellectuals who have worked on this area in terms of research, documentation, training, and uh, also actually taking up the cases. So my first question is to, uh, to Professor Vijayalakshmi Brara, a sociologist, that uh, as a sociologist, what do you have to uh, say when it comes to increase in domestic violence in the current context? Um, okay, um, good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> this is a very, very uh, pertinent, in fact, it is so sad that uh, we have this pandemic. Uh, in the pandemic, we had this, uh, what UN described as the um, shadow pandemic, uh, where you know it described how during the pandemic, the domestic violence increased uh, so many folds because men were all the time 24 seven in the household. 
So they had to then beat their wives. What else they could do? They had no, no other work to do, you know, as if. So yeah, it's a very pertinent question that it has increased over a period of time. Number one issue is, uh, sociologically speaking, you know, that it has domestic violence is perpetuated because it has sanctity from the society. And sanctity is from the society is because we have a very strong power equation we have very strong power, you know, dynamics whereby, you know, patriarchy subsumes uh, that, you know, women have to be subservient. In fact, many sociologists, I would say, have actually, and many scientists have gone on and on to prove that women are, have smaller brains, you know, they are not capable of handling politics, they are not handle, capable of uh, taking the rational decisions, they are emotional, so they have to be handled uh, by the men. So number one is the sanctity part of it and the, the fact that it is acceptable uh, for the women, uh, you know, to be beaten up by their husbands. You know, they, they're often saying, you know, especially I'm, I'm basically actually from Punjab. So you know, there's a basically saying that uh, if the husband will not beat us, will it really beat the neighbor? You know, so as if it is a woman's uh, you know, kind of a, a, a kind of a thing that uh, that ownership and the fact that it's a welcome thing that you know that at least my husband treats me close enough to beat me up. So imagine with that kind of scenario, you know, uh, 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 things are actually quite bad. And unfortunately, you told me to talk about northeast. Uh, that there also the situation is going from bad to worse. Even though we say that women's status is very high, and in fact, a lot of water has flown since that myth has been broken by me and many other sociologists into understanding the fact that you know we have only looked at the outside world of uh, you know northeast women. We have not peeped inside the domestic front. So now that that has coming up now. That is coming up now. You know, Manipur, Manipur particularly, we have very high rise of women-headed households, and uh, divorce rate has uh, risen. And the prime reason for this is polygamy. And uh, polygamy, I think, you know, when we talk about that, uh, you know, domestic violence, we often talk only, you know, primarily about um, physical abuse. But we should also understand that the humiliation, uh, you know, of uh, or your husband, uh, you know, making love to another woman in the bed, next bed and, you know, bringing her in home and with, it's it's a very very I mean one can understand it's a very very humiliating, mentally distressing uh, you know experience. Uh, so that and that is not only in Manipur. In fact, in Arunachal Pradesh, the women's movement are uh, you know the the their prime agenda is to you know the fighting against polygamy and child marriage in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, and uh, so and in Mizoram also we have very high indices of. Women had their households primarily because of this whole drunkardness and drug addiction of the men. Uh, so, you know, this whole leaving the women, it's, it's like, a, you know, leaving a, a hot potato from the ha hand and, you know, it's, it's as simple as that. So this is a, a very, very prime concern. Another concern is the poverty, uh, you know, which is being faced by women because of all these uh, situations. So anyway, as the discussion goes on, I'll keep adding to it. But one thing I would uh, like uh, the, this uh, August audience to understand, and my plea is that, you know, we have to move from the victim-oriented uh, structures to survivor oriented structures because victim immediately you know victim it's a powerlessness the, the word implies powerlessness while survivor implies somebody who has you know made it through and so powerful enough uh, thing like that and also you know we have to move from this whole justice and crime i know we have very a lot of lawyers in the panel but you know we have to move from the, the law and order uh, prism to the health issue of the person. You know, uh, we just don't take it in the court, and then what is happening to her body? What is happening to her mental stress? You know that the so so I would say that you know that health issues also have to become one of the prime agendas in our discussion today. So I will proceed later on as and when. So let others advance. Thank you. I can't hear you.
Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Vijayalakshmi. You brought uh, uh, four very important points. One is about the uh, violation of dignity and also the mental agony that uh, survivor of domestic violence faces. The issues specific to Northeast in terms of like in Manipur or Arunachal Pradesh or uh, Meghalaya, where you talk about the polygamy and also child marriages, which also make women powerless. Drug and alcohol is a very important concern and poverty also. And uh, most important contribution that you made that from victim-oriented framework, we need to uh, have a paradigm shift and we, fo we focus on the survivor and how we empower women. And it is not a law and order issue. It is a very important public health issue with the focus on uh, mental and physical well-being of a person, not only health but also well-being of a person. Now, I would like to ask uh, the, the, our next panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Preeti, uh, Dr. Kirti, uh, that you have uh, formed a very robust organization and it's a very important work that your uh, organization is doing in Vijayawada, Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh was the first state to come up with a gender responsive budgeting for dealing with the domestic violence and it has a very important record of community-based support structures. So can you just tell us the, uh, your personal journey as well as the important landmarks in your uh, whole journey of campaign against domestic violence. Over to Dr. Kirti. Thank you so much eh, for uh, making all of us uh, to be part of it and taking it uh, a very important uh, subject, which is uh, in the gray area, which I can tell it. Uh, me, when I coming from a socially and politically affluent family, but still I face domestic violence. So domestic violence, when we see, it is not, it's only with the poor, is only a myth. So the socially and politically affluent families and educated and everything also, we are facing violence. Because I became a widow at the age of 30 and lost my daughter and I faced violence as a widow, as a young widow. And again in my second marriage, for seven years, I faced severe domestic violence. It is physical, emotional, uh, financial, and sexual. What not? And I can say very clearly, it's an invisible scars. Can you show it? No, we can't show it, some of the things. And also, as a person, we should do have some of the inhibitions and to tell everything to the public or even to our own siblings also. And we are living in a patriarchal society. We don't even talk some of the things with our life partners also. So in that journey, what I have seen and I dedicated my life mission is dignity and respect for the woman. So even the educated women are also unable to come up and give a complaint. In a recent study, I have seen that 90% of the women facing domestic violence are not giving a complaint to the mechanisms which we have like a police or DV cells like that. But they tell to their family members and the family members tell, you get adjusted. And same again, they come back and uh, if they will be vicious cycle of violence is going. On. And the children are also living in the abusive relations in the exposed environment. So what we have taken up an innovative initiative in Vijayawada with the city police is uh, collaborated and a joint initiative is uh, Vasavya Mahila Mandali and 21 police stations in Vijayawada police launched an initiative in Jan 2017. So at each police station, there is a person who received the, uh, now they told victim to be converted to uh, survivor. There I have some more uh, thoughts also. So now at this moment, I call victim and they enter into the police station. Two women constables receive them and trained the 3,700 police cops in Vijayawada from the constable level to the DJ 
a commissioner of police level on gender sensitization and how empathetic they should be when a victim comes to the police station. And then there is a community-based groups are developed and they conduct the, the deliberations at the police station with the police. So that is giving them a kind of a confidence that they can step into the police station because normally in the societies, there is no trust from the police. That's why they don't come. So that's why to give a kind of a coordinative mechanism in the place of the community response and engagement is one of the response which we can give it. Uh, not only the punitive aspect or not only the police, the institutional mechanism. That has given a fantastic uh, uh, response and the women started going to police stations and accompanying the victims and taking to them and going to the schools and giving a preventive education. And at the same time, at public places also, there's a lot of EU teasers in Vijayawada. Within a span of about 34 months, counseled and the, they came to police uh, after the catch hold of them about 7,000 EU teasers, those who are perpetrators were counseled and there is no repeat offender. So in this example, what we can tell is the success is we have to work for the social empowerment of the victim to turn into a survivor and to handle her case confidently and to be a peer for the others and same time, we have to work with the survivor, uh, service provider with empathy and gender sensitization. And also we have to give counseling and reformation among the perpetrators. So this is what a fantastic study, which we have done it and actionable. And a study is also undertaken by University of Edinburgh and it's on a website, which you all can see. It. Maybe in the next, when I get time, I'll, show, I'll share about our experiences uh, and the Pan-India study, which we did on maintenance among women in marital discard. Thank you, Dr. Kirti, for bringing out the whole your personal testimony and the, your heroic battle against domestic violence in your personal life and uh, providing support uh, to other women survivors in a mission mode. And your Vasavya Mahila Mandli, which also has got several awards. I know this week also you got an award and it's a very extremely inspiring work that your organization has done. Now I would like to ask Dr. Gayatri, uh, Advocate Gayatri Sharma, that uh, Women Power Connect as a member, director of Women Power Connect and also as a, a legal practitioner earlier, you were with Lawyers Collective also. You have done a lot of work in terms of training and in terms of um, coming up with the toolkits and also uh, uh, various workshops that you have organized on domestic violence. So can you share some of the experiences that how do we change the mindset of people? Are there any inspiring stories that you can share with us? So, um, first of all, to uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. And to begin with, um, the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act, a lot of its success depends on how well the stakeholders are performing. And um, I am based in Delhi. Wim uh, Women Power Connect, the office is also based in Delhi. And Delhi should, as the capital, have uh, some of the best uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, the uh, stakeholders should be uh, ideally uh, uh, better informed and uh, working as per the law. To some extent, yes, uh, in Delhi, the names of the POs, the names of the service providers, their phone numbers, all of that is available, which is still not there for all the states. However, when we did our workshops and our um, uh, in-depth study on the quality of uh, services available in Delhi, there were new innumerable gaps. Uh, just to name a few, uh, the protection officers, the uh, threat that they feel in dealing with cases unless they have police support and uh, police support is not always there. Legal aid lawyers, uh, they are always looking to make money uh, from the victim and uh, it's very hard how to deal with this because there is a market also at, 
uh, work. And um, so the legal aid lawyers don't want the PO interfering in the case. Um, shelter homes, uh, I think that that is across the country, the shortage of shelter homes. And this became clear during the COVID-19 pandemic until the um, uh, DC, uh, uh, not the DCW, the, uh, 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 Mrs. Rashmi Singh from uh, the Ministry of Women and Child said that mm -hmm. it's uh, no woman can be turned away from a shelter home during the pandemic. She had passed this notification. Um, uh, after COVID-19, uh, 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 we did do one workshop on, uh, and I wanted to just share a success uh, story, uh, with college students on domestic violence that they experienced du during the pandemic. And college students are largely unmarried. So we are talking about 18 to 19 to 20 year olds. And uh, the sort of cases we were expecting were that of uh, gender-based discrimination, men are not helping with the housework uh, and uh, women being overburdened. And of course that was there, but, uh, the number of cases of incest that came out and severe forms of violence during the pandemic. On one hand, it was uh, eye-opening. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think the courage that the younger generation has now in speaking up about issues that earlier were repressed and not uh, spoken about is no longer there. They, they don't hesitate to say that this is what happened. And uh, so and so, uh, and uh, I, I think it's very commendable that at least uh, the slight change is happening with the younger generation, at least in this one study that we did in one college in uh, Delhi University. Yeah. yeah, I think it also reminds me of uh, an incident in, in Kolkata, in West Bengal, where uh, 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 students were asked by a teacher to write about my mother. And one student wrote uh, an essay saying that my mother is very hardworking and she does so much of work, but every day she gets beaten. My heart breaks when I see my mother screaming and crying. And the teacher took teacher took that essay to the principal and both teacher and principal, they went to police station with the girl and the DV actor. They used the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act and the action was taken. That means this uh, uh, training program and the uh, workshops which, that we conduct, I think it has created a new kind of consciousness. I think even in PT also, we should discuss this issue. We are discussing POCSO, we have started discussing, but I think protection of this uh, powder act also must be discussed. So I think it's very encouraging to discuss and see it as a social problem and uh, take it to the students and future generation also that so that they also are away from uh, this kind of uh, mindset, you know, that you can sort anything like your wife is your private, private property or women, even the uh, the question of incest about which people were hardly talking in my generation all of us grew up with seeing and hearing horror stories in private domain but uh, talking about it in public so that action can be taken i think is very important and and that's why i think many many cases of pokso are also reported because the young girls even school girls are reporting more. so thank you dr gatley now i would like to ask uh, uh, madam anchita Kata, what has been your experience your organization's experience Hello? Are you there? No. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. See, uh, from Poriti, we work with uh, women domestic workers. And uh, for a long time, we used to um, uh, work, you know, on a case by case basis as women reported uh, cases of domestic violence. And uh, now, of course, we have a program to address domestic violence. And, um, um, and you know, like many of the panelists here have said that, uh, you know, our focus is specifically working with women domestic workers. But for our uh, uh, domestic violence work, we get, uh, you know, um, we get complaints or we are contacted by people, by women across classes. Um, uh, one of the things I would like to say, you know, because we are talking of PWDVA and a very important contribution that PWDVA has made to the discussion around domestic violence is they have also talked about uh, domestic violence in relationships outside marriage. 
and um, and I think uh, this point came um, to us all very strongly when you know when we read about the Shraddha Walkar murder because uh, I think that was a horrific, uh, absolutely horrific incident that has happened and um, one we have heard about and um, we have all been shocked by the level of brutality but uh, this kind of abuse and violence occurs in relationships between men and women and uh, they need not necessarily be married you know and, and this is something that is uh, very important and we really need to look at this because of course we also know you know ever since the women's movements have been working on issues of domestic violence that a lot of times women think that they are married to a man but actually they are not and um, so these issues are all there and uh, um, you know like um, uh, um, Gayatri ji was just talking about uh, the younger generation changing it's i think in, in issues of uh, domestic violence we for many of us the experience is that the more things change the more they remain the same because uh, young women they are challenging many social norms but again they find themselves um, um, caught in situations that uh, they find very difficult to get out of you know I, and uh, i think the shraddha walkar murder in that in that sense is is uh, illustrative of many things that women experience you know one is this acceptance of violence and uh, the other is when you don't have parental support you you become uh, completely helpless and um, and you know i mean parental support is sort of shorthand for social support but it is important to have that and one of the things that we are trying to do in our work now is in the communities where we work we work in uh, you know urban communities um, urban uh, slums urban settlements uh, in and around kolkata we are actually talking about these issues within the community and um, uh, really trying to explore them with uh, naturally with the women but also with men because we feel it's important for uh, men to uh, tackle this issue and and not and you know think about why they are violent and why is uh, um, uh, violence against women or domestic violence so normalized and also as uh, you were saying earlier that you know you were talking about pox so but this whole business of normalizing domestic violence it's it's like it's okay for men to be violent towards their wives similarly it is okay for adults to be violent towards children in the domestic space and uh, so we are now connecting all of this and saying that if if we want homes free of violence then any kind of violence is a no no we, we can't just say it is uh, wrong to be wise but then again those women as mothers are beating children or everyone is beating children and it is it is considered perfectly normal you know it's it's like it, yeah. people talk about it in normal conversation it's it's and and this again is across classes so this is uh, one of the things but uh, so we are and you know during the uh, 16 days campaign against uh, gender violence we we talk about issues within the community we do exercises with people in the community so we are trying to bring the issue of domestic violence you know it is public it is public but in many ways it is not public because uh, people will not uh, side with the women or people will say you know it's between them and they'll sort it out it's it's <laughs> just one of you know i mean sometimes you feel very tired because you feel you know we've been talking about this for 30 years 40 years 50 years but people are still saying the same things but uh, this discussion has to go on and and we feel i mean it's it's important you know it's uh, which is why it was very um, heartening to hear gayatri ji talk about talking to uh, college students or i mean this is something we have to discuss all the time within communities within schools within colleges because um, you know it's 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 good to of course we need a strong system of the law with the criminal justice system has to be more active but communities also communities individuals all have to say that uh, this is not something that is acceptable yeah you know, it's, it's uh, 
And I think one thing that only helplines are not enough. Helplines are okay to report the case, but I think handholding is very important. Yes, and if you see Shadda Valkar case, not is being reported because it also has a communal angle. But otherwise also in most of the cases reported where, where women are completely uh, uh, helpless, where they don't have anyone to turn to, I think but that makes them more vulnerable. Also, no? this, yeah. is, this, is, this is the way parents look. I mean, hello, am I? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, you are audible. Yes. It's so easy to turn your back on your daughter because she's not doing what you expect her to do. Got it. And, and, and that's, that's, that's all me. I mean, important learning. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I mean, I mean, this is something we have always known, but this is a horrible case that has come up. And yes. And yeah. it's um, it's it's really, and I think everywhere. I mean, I think it's very important in schools and colleges to talk about this. You know, it's, yes, it's not yeah. only that NGOs will go in and conduct sessions, Sorry. but uh, but the um, uh, teaching community should also be talking to their students because. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's really heartrending when you hear that women with PhDs kill themselves because their husbands are beaten. Yes. Yeah, thank you for bringing out this role of community and also uh, why everybody in the system, whether it's a law and order machinery, police, uh, criminal justice system, and the community both have to take a very serious note of this and also responsive. They have to be responsive. That's very important. Yes, we are uh, also, you know, training people in communities to respond yes. to for yeah. uh, for rapid response to cases. Got it. Yeah. Because you can't always be depending on the NGO and their help. Line and their workers, I mean, NGOs never have enough stuff. Yeah, and the early signals, them. responding to early signals, no, not yes. waiting till they commit suicide yes. or they are killed, no. Because yes. even in case of Radha, she had told the colleague, she had told the police, she had made FIR, but still uh, not much action was taken. No? So that is there. So now, Dr. Tara Nair, I would like to ask about uh, the findings of your research on intimate partner violence. And you are also now director of Ajivika. So you work with the migrant workers and what kind of vulnerabilities you see among these women who come to the main uh, uh, import uh, megapolis and they come to the uh, big cities. Uh, what kind of vulnerabilities do they face in the domestic arena? Dr. Tara Nair. Are you there? Yeah. yeah. Am I audible now? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Only thing we really are not able to see your face. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for this uh, this opportunity to yeah. be in the midst of uh, you know stellar uh, sort of you know practitioners and lawyers. Um, yeah. As as you said, my experience is largely in terms of you know trying to understand uh, you know how. Uh, domestic violence or intimate partner violence, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, can be sort of, you know, uh, what do you call it, addressed uh, in in what are the what are, what could be the major, major solutions, etc. Uh, so, or, uh, and I must, uh, you know, I think much much of the uh, sort of you know analytical aspects about uh, you know what what perhaps uh, you know causes domestic violence or. Uh, why it still persists uh, have already been this, but I must start by saying that uh, perhaps you know one uh, uh, gets a feeling uh, that the project to transform social norms and uh, challenge patriarchy, uh, that project is perhaps uh, you know faced with uh, much much larger roadblocks than ever before in current times, and uh, uh, you know it's, it's it's definitely hugely worrying to see the quantum, not only the quantum. Even the degree of violence, you know, the brutality involved in, uh, you know, the kind of violence that women and girls across the country are facing in recent years, uh, you know. Um, but you know, uh, if you look at the uh, cases which attract uh, media attention, we still discuss a very, very minuscule uh, proportion of that in terms of, uh, you know, like uh, as 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 issues. Even there, uh, you know, like the media has largely sort of you know sensationalize the uh, the crime or the the gruesomeness of the murder and things like that but uh, even the media has not really contributed enough in terms of uh, you know diagnosing uh, a case in terms of its legal health social uh, sort of you know that kind of a, a, a kind of a framework but generally it's a kind of a very sensational crime story uh, that's that's how it uh, comes to be 
uh, i think there should be i think before going anywhere i thought we must do something very urgent about it especially a large number of you know regional uh, language uh, reporters and stringers and all work in uh, you know different states of india uh, you know i think there should be something like a capacity building program or something to make them uh, more sensitive towards you know those aspects of uh, a, a case uh, a case of gender violence rather than a sensational crime story and it generally gets into the into the pages of crime reports rather than human rights violation or you know like uh, uh, other kinds of issues i think there should be something which uh, you know we, we need to really do something uh, very conscious and uh, quite concerted there uh, coming very quickly to uh, my uh, interest in uh, you know uh, ipv thing i think the study that i have done uh, was largely to find out how community solutions can be uh, sort of you know or what really even prevents community solutions to come to the fore uh, i know that there are a, there are a large number of uh, exemplary work uh, happening uh, you know from the from the from the side of you know uh, civil society organizations ngos women's collectives and all that but if you really look at the uh, to the investment in collectives uh, we see a significant decline in uh, investment in collectives and uh, uh, you know like uh, there was a lot of talk about all these things after 2012 especially after the nirbhaya incident you know i think there was some about of uh, hyperactivism and in debates and uh, you know like uh, uh, you know uh, kind of you know public debates uh, but it definitely died died down and if you look at the kind of uh, you know uh, um, kind of resources spent on creating response uh, sort of structures across the states you find nothing much is really happening uh you know that thing uh, you know that is even in terms of you know uh, one stop centers or other kinds of investments and i don't think we are really serious about some of those things i'm talking about from the state's point of view and uh, uh, you know investing in collectors has been an extremely low priority uh, in the uh, in in the in the state circles uh, you know one of the state that i very very clearly follow is kerala partly because of my cultural affinity towards that state i grew up there a uh, part of women's movements and i think it really shocks me with the uh, complete uh, kind of you know uh, disproportionate relationship between women's participation in economic activities education levels and the perpetration of violence against women so it simply really defies any kind of connections between you know or the indicators of empowerment that we really generally talk about nothing really works when patriarchy rules Uh, so you know uh, those kinds of realities be uh, also recognized and i think even in kerala uh, you know uh, the women component plan you know like uh, since 2009 or so uh, the state plan says that is about 10% of the plan funds should be given for women development initiatives but the the, the performance of that uh, wcp has not been there. very encouraging at all uh, it's 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 called like a recent spate right? of dowry murders no and also the dowry murders putting my uh, kodot study yeah, of yeah, increased yeah. dowry murders yeah and i'm saying that there is a budget mechanism called women component plan which is not a small amount which is 10% of the plan fund the despite keeping that money aside things are not really happening so that's the that's the point we need to take uh, note of and even this women component plan in kerala is almost like an orphan child that's the that's an expression that you know like generally we say uh, there is no incentive for greater expenditure or no disincentive for not spending or anything so it is just a kind of a pot of money lying aside not being sort of you know spent wisely or uh, properly etc etc so uh, yeah. and on any panchayat panchayat raj institution really no how to make use of this money and what should be done and things like that so i think it's a even a program like kudumbashri uh you know i think uh, which economizes uh, you know empowerment and somehow has not been able to really very effectively address uh, you know an issue like uh, you know domestic violence or gender violence in in, in general so the uh, kind of you know uh, i you know i'm saying all these things uh, i because i believe that the state has a responsibility to kind of you know like respond to this not leaving everything to an individual enterprise and uh, you know like a uh, uh, civil society action uh, you know it's it's a, it's a, it's one of the uh, kind of most important responsibility of the state to actually deliver some significant things on uh, these things even in andhra pradesh i think if you look at the uh, in 2014 when the state became bifurcated you know telangana and uh, uh, in andhra pradesh uh, the scrp uh, you know uh, you know also got 
uh, you know, the state rural uh, kind of you know, poverty eradication program also got uh, uh, bifurcated. In fact, since the time, women's collectives in the state actually went in, into serious trouble. You know, really? they really did not have enough money to really carry out their activities. And maybe something is being spent on travel or something, but actually their core activities, the, uh, you know, the most relevant activities are not really getting enough funding from, uh, you know, uh, from the government in the name of expenditure rationalization, et cetera, et cetera. It has actually been sort of, uh, you know, in fact, I, I, as if I understand right, in Andhra Pradesh, there is no gender development department yet. You know, it has actually been pushed to Telangana. So the state does not have a department to deal with, uh, you know, these kinds of uh, issues. So budget constraints uh, at the state level, underfunding uh, of, uh, uh, you know, these kinds of activities. I think these very seriously impede uh, continued functioning and sustainability of, you know, programs which really deal with, uh, you know, violence uh, kind of things. Yeah, but uh, if so, yeah. Yeah, even when the funding is there, you know, I fully agree. I think you and Dr. Kirti also yeah. said that it is uh, oh, just uh, like economizing empowerment is not enough uh, because women across the class backgrounds, they even those who are earning and who are economically independent also face varied form of domestic violence. And recent cases of uh, dowry murders among the very women, highly educated women from a very affluent class, I think that also shows that how patriarchy uh, and the patriarchal control over women's lives is so strong. Uh, yeah, I, but I think most people really even about one. Sorry, just one for point that I want to really support, uh, uh, you know, uh, Archita ji, uh, Anchita ji, when she, when he, talk, and I think it was also Dr. Kirti who mentioned that investing in men, uh, men's collectives or, you know, in involving men and boys in this, uh, you know, uh, in this struggle yeah. and understanding yeah. masculinity, uh, you know, while we are also talking about and how masculinity is work. And there were several programs in the, in the earlier days called Parivartan, where we were using sports and sports coaches to, uh, you know, give the lesson of masculinity to young boys and all that, but none of that, none of them really received any kind of financial, uh, you know, uh, sort of support uh, for sustainably continuing their activities. Yeah, I think you were saying something. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, saying that even union budget, we have a Nirbhaya fund since 2013, 1000 crore per year are allocated. Hardly five or six have you, uh, six states have used them and that to 40 to 50 percent. So even when you have a resources part or the financial allocation made money parked in the ministry, it is not used. So that itself shows the kind of uh, uh, either bureaucratic is. lethargy or the antipathy. <laughs> towards this because I remember when I went to gender resource center and the moment we talked about domestic violence even IAS officer I think principal secretary he just snubbed me and saying that if we start uh, providing support women will start running away and families will break if this is the kind of mindset if the people in power have what kind of uh, alternative do we have even when what kind of funds or functions or functionaries they are going to allocate no? so that is a very important challenge that we are facing the kind of gender sensitization programs we had during 80s and 90s i think they have stopped whether it is in police academy or for the uh, politicians earlier of days to have it for the elected representatives at every level i think they need to restart but at least uh, then, then their views will come out no about misogyny and insensitivity towards women's uh, yeah. violence against women so advocate celine thomas uh, uh, you have been practicing lawyer and what have been your experiences so far as the issues concerning domestic violence linked to family laws also? Because every time women demand either a maintenance or uh, any alimony or child custody, they also face uh, tremendous domestic violence. So can you share some of the experiences of yours while in these uh, court cases? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel. Uh, and thank you, Impri, for inviting me uh, to this forum. and. Uh, thank you to all the esteemed panelists who are present here. So I practice as a lawyer in Bangalore. Uh, before I dive into the specifics of law or even deal with it, I'd ra rather share a case study. It is a case that I'm handling right now. It's a pro bono case. Uh, I will not be able to divulge in the name of the complainant. However, I'd like to give you a quick background of what it is. 
this is a girl who's only 19 years old. Uh, she's not an Indian, she's a Nepali. Now, uh, let me explain you one thing that in Bangalore, we have a sizable Nepali uh, migrant population that has moved in here. They come here, they live in their own flocks and their own community, and they have their own social structure. And uh, they have their own way of doing justice amongst themselves. So what happens is that most of the women and men do not reach out to the conventional uh, legal systems or the law enforcement mechanisms which are in place for uh, redressing any of their issues. So what happens is they have a sham of a khap panchayat uh, that exists within their community that decides the fate of every person over there who decides to be a deviant or to so to speak the community perceives that this, this person is a deviant so uh, the pro bono case that i'm working on is a nepali girl and she's only 19 years old and she's considered to be this deviant in her community uh, Incidentally, a year ago, she used to work as a domestic help at my place, and she knew that I was a lawyer. And when she moved on to a better paying job, I congratulated her and I wished her well. And because she knew a little bit of English and she could speak the local dialect, which is Kannada, uh, she found a job as a receptionist, which was a better paying job. But the abuse at her home was something I was completely oblivious to, you know, because she never shared it with me. It was only recently that she reached out to me saying that there is a lot of abuse being meted out to her by her husband, who is uh, currently 26 years old. So you can imagine the age difference between them. So I asked her when she got married and she said two years ago. Now, two years ago, she was 17 years old. She was a minor as per our law. So she was not someone who was supposed to get married at that age. But it so happened that she has been betrayed by almost every person, not just her husband, but in even her parents, her in-laws, every member in her community. It has so happened that, uh, um, you know, one fine day, um, her parents decided to cut her birthday cake, claiming to the entire society that it is her 18th birthday. This was 14th of September, two years ago. And just 10 days later, they got her married. So it was almost like an eye wash, not only uh, to the family members, but to the entire society so that nobody questions the fact that she was actually a minor when they were getting her married. And uh, they didn't want any social rebuke or anyone asking any kind of questions if, if at all the girl was a minor or not. They had stopped her education also abruptly because probably she was turning out to be a financial burden for them. And they were a family, of, uh, you know, two elders and four children. And she turned out to be a liability for them. So they got her married. They got her married to a guy who is a bus driver in a private school. Uh, he had um, issues with her right from the second week of the marriage, you know, wherein he used to keep uh, calling her really bad words, you know, like, uh, um, I, I don't want to disrespect anyone's sensibility, but they were real bad words, you know, almost saying that she's into sex work and things like that, and she's having relationship with here and there, but she's like any other teenager having uh, an online presence. She's very active on social media, especially Instagram. And she has absolute strangers following her. But then she is like any other teenage girl or a boy of her age who enjoys being on social media because that's where they have friends, you know? So um, her husband was, uh, it's very uh, clear to all of us that he's a very insecure man and he couldn't handle the fact that you know that she had friends online and that she she had friends otherwise also and the fact if she would be half an hour late at work and return home a little late he would again accuse her of sex work but he had no qualms in taking the money from her whatever she was earning from all this work that she was doing so uh, it escalated to such an extent wherein it started affecting her health and she reached out to me also at that point and I said what is it that she wants to do so uh, I actually tried to empower her at every stage that is possible because she had to realize walking out of a marriage or walking out of her family home uh, the protection of her maternal home or even the solace that she finds in her community she will not get it outside so it's a huge decision to step out you know because you're not only cutting off getting out of your marriage you are cutting all your bonds in your family uh, and even your friends and even your community so for her it was a huge step to take so we were going back and forth for close to six months 
it was only when she one fine day told her husband that you know if you don't give me a divorce i'll be left with no other choice but to go to the police and she started to walk out of the house that's when her husband held her and said that no 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 let's let's try to make this work okay if you want a divorce i'll give you a divorce the very next day he circulates a morphed photo of her with another man god knows from where he found that guy and he morphed that photo and he circulated it to the entire community and then they had to uh, assemble this uh, emergency uh, based uh, panchayat and uh, the head of the community whom they address as mukhiya he uh, slapped her in front of everyone uh, the girl's parents also slapped her in front of everyone every nobody was willing to hear her side of the story you name it the kind of that is the kind of violence that she was subjected to in the name of marriage verbal emotional mental financial sexual everything physical violence everything was meted out to her she was trying to tell her story but nobody was willing to listen to her and then finally uh, she couldn't live with her husband so she was staying at her mother's place and they also said that you know by tomorrow morning 6:30 you should be gone and one fine day she just came out and she came to my doorstep and um, this time she has no money she has nothing in her hand even her mobile phone was destroyed by her husband because he didn't want her to talk to me or anybody else seek out help or ga- gain any kind of intercession from anyone outside the community now when the uh, matter came to this uh, you know wherein we had to take some action with respect to what has happened to her the very first thing that i did was i took her to the karnataka state women's commission i registered a complaint there they directed us to go to the jurisdictional police station and we did that as well uh, it took us 3 days to get an fir done we had different levels of uh, challenges the police is not exactly friendly and it's not exactly uh, supportive to women uh, or should i say at every stage they were uh, helping in trying to know uh, what is the uh, the husband's phone number and i was very reluctant in sharing that because i said unless and until you take a complaint what's the point in giving you any kind of number because i know that police uh, tends to do a lot of back channeling and back door dealings and then again the uh, you know the woman in distress continues to remain in distress and there is no um, you know no solution to her uh, situation but here the complication was that uh, me being a lawyer is not enough because this girl needed um, a place to live uh, food to eat and even employment she even needs a counseling support so i had to reach out to uh, a lot of my uh, people in my resources who were here in bangalore so as a lawyer you can fight the case you can represent them before police station you can go to state women's commission you can do a lot of things but there is a restriction to which even uh, to what extent you can stretch yourself because uh, uh, at times it does create a hole in your pocket you know Uh, and uh, what happened to me was eventually I had to reach out to a shelter home wherein she could be kept for a few days before she could find an employment. And most of the shelter homes which are there in Bangalore, they are very cash strapped, and uh, they find it very difficult to take in um, anybody without any kind of recommendation or some kind of an undertaking or even a formal FIR. So there were a lot of challenges that were there. To top it all, uh, this girl also was twelve weeks pregnant. and uh, she also needed medical attention because it was not just the um, the mtp procedure that she had chosen to undergo which required medical attention but she also had other health issues which required medical attention in addition to that uh, what we discovered was that she needed counseling support as well because for her she was isolated completely uh, she is a classic example of someone who is uh, uh, what we say a rebel you know and uh, but she was classified not as a rebel but more as a deviant in her society everyone wanted to make an example out of her which is why that sham of a cap panchayat was also held you know so that she gets rebuked she gets isolated and every girl in the community in their community is forewarned that if you do something this is what is going to happen to you and it so happened that when i was looking for a job for her uh the same members of the community everyone had her photo so a prospective employer where i took her for an interview you know uh to be taken in as an assistant to manage a boutique that lady showed me the photo that same morphed photo that her husband had circulated in the community so it's not just in her community but she is being uh, sidelined even outside her community so they are trying to completely destroy her 
Now, uh, what happened is when I kept her in the shelter home, I ensured that she was not uh, accessible to anyone because I primarily feared after what happened in that panchayat, in that assembly, she will be attacked in some or the other way because the community is essentially very violent. Okay, And she's not the first person to walk out. There have been other girls who have escaped because they didn't want to get married. They wanted to study further. And in fact, these are the stories that I've heard from this girl itself. So uh, when I kept her in safety, people knew that she was talking to me, you know. So her uh, parents, her uh, family, relatives, everyone has been calling out to me. And look at the statements that they make. One of her uncles said that, wo hamari daulat hai. you know, so they have actually commodified her you know so they 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 don't want to accept the fact that uh, you know that she she deserves to be treated with dignity she deserves to be treated with respect i asked them questions and uh, why why her parents isolated her why they slapped her in front of the entire community when she's actually the victim then they are saying okay if uh, if she wants uh, she she can teach a lesson to her husband but tell her to spare her parents but that's not how the law works. The moment in the complaint, it reflects that she was a minor when she got married automatically, not only just DV applies, but also POXO, Section 376 of IPC, which is rape, as well as Child Marriage Act, sections of those also get uh, applied to the complaint. So what has happened is right now, uh, you know, her husband is uh, behind bars. There's a bail application pending. I'm appearing on behalf of the victim as well. Uh, now, here's, here's what I understand, you know, I had plenty of challenges, you know, it's not just the legal challenges, but also the fact that I shared that she needed support in terms of uh, finding a job, uh, finding a safe place to live, and also some kind of a mental and emotional anchorage. So what I understand is that it has to be a collective effort to help just one survivor of domestic effort, violence. Exactly. And to say that uh, correct, uh, correct, domestic yeah. violence happens, uh, um, you know, only domestic violence happens. Well, in this case, I was under the impression it is only domestic violence, but it is only later when the complaint was being drafted, I realized that she's a minor. You know, when she was married, she was a minor. So, so many things came out, you know. So it's not always domestic abuse that happens. There are so many other things that happen parallelly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, for someone like her, belongs to a certain community, they come with their own uh, ideas and preconceived notions and they, they, they bring it to our country and they, they force it upon their women. In fact, the bail application which is filed in which the lawyer has blatantly written that people get married pretty early in the community. I mean, which court is going to accept that statement? You know, but they have written it. But it is not a customary practice. It is not a customary practice even in the Nepali community. That yeah. is something we have to understand. Because Nepal also has very many progressive laws and over the last exactly. 20 years, a yes. lot has happened in Nepal also. So yes. now I would like to, uh, there is a very important learning from this particular uh, case study that you have given. And I think that there are similar experiences, I think Dr. Tara Nair's study and all Dr. Kirti's uh, uh, experience of intervention is also showing. So now uh, I would like to ask uh, Advocate Gayatri Sharma that how in Delhi, uh, Delhi has a special women's police. If we have a women's police, all women police station, does it make any difference in response? of the system okay i can see advocate selin saying no it doesn't and uh, i think what uh, um, so i i don't have much experience with the women police but i know do know that with women magistrates who deal with pwdva cases because it all goes to the uh, magistrate court and uh, they're all women in the most of them um we cannot say that women will necessarily be more sensitive than uh, men because uh, it a lot has to do with the gender stereotypes and socialization that you're also brought up with. Uh, I think with the comments that have been coming even in chat that involvement of men and boys is necessary <laughs> is uh, something that I would agree with. And um, automatically just having a woman would not uh, make them more sensitive but just very briefly from Delhi a good practice that has come about is um, the crime against women said it has regular meetings with NGOs to discuss domestic violence cases and prior to the pandemic they uh, 
they used to work, you know, they would give the day for the meeting is tomorrow, you have to come uh, tomorrow. Now they've started giving a longer period of time, uh, notice for the NGOs to come, they listen to the NGOs as well for the cases, and they give help in particular uh, cases where the NGO is stuck. So these regular meetings are working very well. And they are chaired either uh, by a male or female uh, officer. So um, I think that is a good practice in Delhi. Yes. Just to add to what Doc, uh, you know, um, Gayatri is saying, Dr. Patel, uh, women's police station is a great idea and a great concept. But what we need to understand is that um, where there is an all women's police station, where there will be a woman constable or a woman police inspector, we need to understand uh, she's first police and then a woman. <laughs> You know, so the treatment that will be meted out to any victim or any survivor of domestic violence or any woman who's suffering sexual assault, she's going to get the same treatment that she'll get to any other police station. You know, that is something that we need to understand. So the sensitize, so the only thing about a woman's police station is more of an eye wash. Okay. Uh, it is just to encourage women to go there. And in fact, even in the case that I shared, in that case study itself, we were in fact directed by the jurisdictional police station to go to the women's police station. And I said, is there, a, the, but the women's commission had asked us to come to the jurisdictional police station. Now, if we are going to the women's, women's police station, then the order also has to come from them. And they had no answer to that. That's when they took in our FIR, you know. So they do make us run from pillar to post. So having a all women's police station, there needs to be a, a mandate very clear as it should benefit the survivor in some way. I just like to add uh, one thing, keeping in view my experience that keeping in view the magnitude of the problem of the domestic violence, as per reports itself, one in three are facing domestic violence. Then every police station should be gender sensitive. It is, we don't require, because even if we have to make women police stations also, we don't have that much of manpower now. And it needs to have a strategically, maybe it takes 10 years or 20 years to bring into 50,000, 3% stage. So that's why every police station, we should see that it is in a position to receive the uh, applications or uh, complaints from the victims in a similar mode. That's very, very essential. So that empathy and gender sensitization should be the part of the curriculum of the police. I would- uh, Thank you, Dr. Kirti. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I would like to flag two things uh, coming from the, you know, I mean, I'm so privileged today, Vibhuti ma'am, that I'm listening to the grassroots people and who are really working. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm understanding is, you know, uh, also we're talking about the police station and uh, things like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to understand that uh, the appearance uh, of, the, of the survivor, the appearance of the survivor is made to be very, very judgmental. Uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, in the, I have heard, a, I've read, I, I've got this case study where, you know, uh, for example, uh, wait, just a minute. Huh? Um, okay, here they say that, um, you know, that, um, uh, that <clears throat> when they go to the police, it is how she's dressed, how she looks. Does she look damsel in distress? You know, uh, does she have that kind of, uh, you know, uh, appearance where we can believe that actually she was, you know, violated? You know, this, uh, the judgmental aspect of it, you know, and it is, it goes into the most gender sensitive people, uh, you know, because why I'm saying is this, because the patriarchal, uh, you know, imaging and the, ex, uh, the willing to be accepted in that mold of patriarchy is so strong among all of us. I mean, let us confess this today. It is so strong that how we dress, how we, what we eat, where we go out, what we see, what we read, or, you know, everything, and we need acceptance from the patriarchal mold, you know. So the, 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 the structures are so strong, uh, you know, it's very difficult. So at least, you know, the, 
as I, as I requested, uh, for, like, forget calling them uh, victims and also the appearances of it. You know, let's not be judgmental and let's not just say, oh, she was wearing this dress. Oh, you know, she was, she's talking to me eye to eye, you know. So if she has so much confidence level, how can she be a, you know, how can she survive in the, the so uh, all that paradigms uh, need to, you know, be shackled and broken up, uh, you know, over a period of time. And I think at grassroots, uh, you know, the workers, the lawyers, I mean, hats off to you all. You are really doing a great work in breaking these kind of paradigms. Thank you very much. That time and again, and this has been right from the beginning. Any woman who is articulate, confident, who argues, provides evidences, police would just not trust her. That she she doesn't fit into their image of a victim, no. And so many times they have said that if I had such woman as my wife, I would have also beaten her. That's what one has heard even from the police officers. No? So it's a very, very, I think account, creating an accountability system is a major challenge. There are three responses in the chat box. Uh, one is by uh, Anima. Would you like to unmute and speak? Because you have written about your personal, uh, your personal views and you are talking about, I think you are reiterating the point that we should work with men and boys. But would you like to make uh, any statements? Anima, are you there? Dr. Suna, you have also said that your experiences of Tamil Nadu, where you say that all women police station make miracles to happen. Would you like to share some of your first-hand experiences? And there is a Satyavati who has also said that we are from Bhumika Women's Collective. You can share your experiences also, Satyavati. Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, and uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Anima ji, you so can... Satyavati, Suna, and uh, Anima, would you like uh, to... Hello, I'm yes? Anima. Yes, Anima. Please unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah. Uh, actually, you know, uh, the thing is like uh, there are so many case studies. If you open the newspaper every day, there is one or the other case. And uh, if you just take the statistics, then you will find that in the past few years, the crime against women has risen um, um, I mean, tremendously. So, uh, I mean, these crimes are sometimes direct, sometimes indirect, sometimes those are like uh, psychological hidden and in every way and it is not only in india but everywhere you go i mean take any example it is happening everywhere where, and irrespective of any religion or community or race or ethnic ethnicity i mean uh, the crimes are happening and this, these are rising it's a fact i've been to africa too i mean and th there i found like uh, like women are treated very badly even uh, not only their own women, but the women who work there from outside, they are equally treated bad. So, I mean, I have come, I, I mean, through my experiences, I have learned that uh, we should engage men into our uh, programs. And, uh, and there is a, uh, there's one global program proposed by UN, Engaging Men. Engaging Men is like, uh, uh, if a man says something, to the to uh, to the boys or uh, to the I mean, uh, adolescent children something then it makes more sense if uh, i speak and if a woman speaks then uh, it it is not taken seriously so I mean, my emphasis is that this is high time that we should review over all the policies we should review over all the advocacies and find out the flaws because you know the thing is not to making any difference even in America, where from where the movement uh, started in 1970s, even there the women, the status of women is, uh, has hardly changed. So I think this is high time we should review all the programs and I mean, uh, uh, these all I mean rights made for the women and all, and engage men. Yeah, that's very important. Your point of engaging men is, I think, very important. There and thank you, um, uh, Anima ji. Uh, now I would re I request uh, uh, Satyavati ji and uh, Dr. Suna. Would you like to share your experiences, Dr. Suna? Sunanda. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Sunanda. Yes, good. Good yeah. evening. I'm uh, Dr. Sunanda. Uh, I was a police officer. That's why I'm. Uh, we're talking about the women police station in Tamil, Tamil Nadu. Actually, the uh, women police are given special training on this gender sensitization, as well as uh, the uh, how to work in a women police station. 
of course uh, it is not uh, uh, we can't say that it is um, all the women police stations are uh, functioning in the way in which it is supposed to there will be uh, flaws also but then most of the cases get uh, the problems get redressed either they will register a case first they will do the counseling uh, and then uh, they will have a um, panel of uh, psychiatrists or a psychologist an advocate uh, a, a counselor family counselor and uh, um, uh, we will have 10 types of even uh, retired judges are included in that uh, this family count this is known as family counseling center this center will function in each all women police station and they will take a decision according to the um, gravity or according to the configuration of the uh, case later they will decide if they are uh, if, through counseling if they could um, uh, bring the family reunite then uh, uh, that will be taken uh, care of in that way they will be called for reviews weekly review then monthly review then once in a while they come and uh, tell uh, what is how do they live otherwise after some time they will approach the police station again for the next action course of action the police station then will register a case after getting opinion from the app this is what is happening in tamil nadu all women police stations yeah and uh, what is the budgetary allocation for this uh... What kind of support services all women police station over and above counseling, other intervention, are they connected with the hospital and for the medical aid and for the shelter home? So uh, is it more of a one-stop center? We give a, a letter to any of these institutions if then there is a need. Then oh. they will take, we will, we will contact the social development, uh, social, um, yeah, um, SD, they call it. Social, social development office. development okay. office yes that okay. is uh, they will be placed in the uh, collect rate no yeah uh, collect we rate. will inform them they will take care of it uh, yeah because even for that cradle baby scheme collect rate was the center no the, okay. even when tamil nadu had that scheme yes yes yeah, yeah. it's yes. a very very important yeah very inspiring i think in this whole grim uh, reality that the kind of expert you need a lot of commitment no on the part of uh, people yes. with authority and power so yes. do you have gender sensitization programs also? Yes, please. Yes, we used to have. Yes, and right. we had, um, uh, we have family counseling members also. When I was in Chennai, there once in a week, twice a week, two counselors from any of the NGOs will be uh, asked to come and counsel the um, uh, victims. Achha, so the state, the yeah, state and non-state act, NGOs and GOs, they work together yes. in tandem. Yes. So then, yes. then you are effective. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunanda. It's a very inspiring your experiences. May I ask one question to Dr. Sunanda? Like I was wondering, where is uh, the survivor rehabilitated if it comes to that? You know, or yeah. generally, what, what, what is the police station, the police officers do? Do they counsel her to go back to the home where the abuse happened? Or, uh, you know, what, what do they do? Yeah, yes. Only after uh, counseling, if we feel that it is fit, we will be sending them. I had a very bad experience once. Um, we did the counseling. Uh, we sent the girl back to the family, uh, the, man, the the groom, uh, uh, groom's uh, family. That is after the ascent of both the parent and the in-laws. But then after some time, uh, she was found in the railway track dead. So we take much care about that. Uh, we, the, after uh, we get the um, consensus of the counselors who come from the NGOs. In Chennai, that is a practice. All the all women police station will have one or other uh, NGO uh, coming and giving counseling for these uh, victims. Yes, after the preliminary investigation by the emphasis on in government programs to attempt the reconciliation and um, that doesn't always uh, work to the advantage of the survivor yeah 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 
thank you uh, uh, yeah uh, and, uh, and, uh, i think one thing we are missing out here is a uh, you know uh, which was uh, slightly touched upon by um, uh, anchita ghatak was that uh, you know this whole you know mother beating the children kind of thing but another thing which is, uh, which is very very pertinent also is and also i see it very much in uh, manipur and northeast particularly is the violence meted on the lgbtq community yeah yeah, yeah. very yeah. Much. so I, I, and that, that that also has to come in that the promise yes domestic violence correct and by their own parents because now they have started a like a center for uh, lgbtqia community where they are uh, violated by their natal family you know by their own parents brothers sisters and all so that's very important yes yes there is satyavati kondavne ji uh, who is from bhumika women's collective uh, and she has written in the chat box would you like to share your experiences satyavati ji are you there hello satyavati ji are you there then dr vg has also written in the chat box uh, would you like to speak dr vg uh, yes ma'am thank you for such a wonderful session um i it was actually a eye opener to me that uh, even that kind of uh, system exists especially in the nepali community case uh, which ma'am was discussing um i think uh, from my own experiences what i have feel i have felt in the university system and all i think the education about gender sensitization should start in the family especially uh, the father and the mother both should be educated in such a way and sensitized in such a way that the male child should be uh, sensitized at a very young age Uh, so that it sits in their mind and when they grow up that they should treat a uh, female counterpart as equal to them even in the case of uh, family responsibilities household chores everything because if we started in the family at an young age then i think it will stay with them when they become adult right. otherwise if we try to uh, put that thing in their mind when they are adult then it may not be uh, that much uh, useful because they have been seasoned already in the family that you know they are superior and somehow i have seen uh, that children's birthday when they celebrate they celebrate only the birthday of male child they don't exactly. celebrate the birthday of female child yeah. and it was very surprising to me to see those kind of uh, systems existing even today in the societies and families so uh, i think that should be taken care of right from yeah. the very young age yeah. we need to feed this into the mind of young children and i think the national education policy 2021 also says gender sensitization has to begin from preschool level no then only the mindset will change we yes. have uh, thank you, uh, thank we, you have uh, uh, gala. Uh, gala, we have professor asha gala asha gala you are speaking uh, you, you have written about emotional violence would you like to speak please uh, unmute yourself and speak and after that we have two more who have raised hands yeah yeah satyavati ji uh, dr asha gala are you there uh, then satyavati ji you have raised hand please please unmute yourself and speak yeah am i audible yes madam yeah yeah thank you thank you uh, professor vipudi ji the very good uh, program i am hearing from the beginning so i want to share with uh, with you all that uh, bhumika women's collective is working in uh, telangana and andhra pradesh our uh, main uh, uh, work is on gender based violence so we uh, work with the police very closely we give trainings to them we uh, uh, work with the wcd uh, dlsa and uh, in uh, judiciary also we organize trainings to judges also on gender training uh, gender sensitization so regarding this uh, women police stations and the police attitudes we are running uh, uh, nearly nine centers in uh, police stations in ap and telangana so our experience is our presence will made a impact on police definitely definitely the survivor will come to our centers first then uh, they will go to police so we connect them to all support systems available to uh, sakhi center we are also running two sakhi centers in telangana you know two districts in telangana the sakhi centers are uh, managed by ngos maybe i don't know in, in other uh, states so uh, regarding uh, this police stations and the police helpline uh, police attitudes 
we must work with police. We, 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 it, it is a, it, it is a very important to work with police because whenever a woman uh, faces any violence, she will be a hundred percent reaching the police station. She is now they are uh, coming to uh, one stop centers or uh, we call it Saki centers. Yeah, like your one stop centers are community based, no, not hospital based. No, 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 no. not hospital based. We have our own buildings. Yeah. We, we, we have our own buildings and we established in that uh, uh, every uh, district is having a one-stop center and we call it in Telugu Sakhi Center. It's a Telugu Sakhi Center. Okay. Yeah, uh, Sakhi Center. Just to, add, uh, just to add to what Satyavati ji is saying, uh, Dr. Patel, we also have uh, Sakhi Centers in Karnataka. Yes. Right now, they are known as uh, Nirbhaya Sakhi Center. In yeah, that, yes. there are counselors provided. Yeah, yes, there are social yes. workers, case workers also. There is, yeah. uh, there is a doctor who is uh, constantly there on call and if there is a rape case or any sexual assault case, then they yeah. are asked uh, to go to the uh, registered government hospital wherein there will be a pl panel of uh, OBGYN and trained nurses who can uh, administer the MLC. Yeah. And it is also located to the nearest uh, women's police station. And each district has got one such center uh, wherein usually there are empaneled lawyers as well. Uh, they are legal aid lawyers. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. there are also... Um, you know, systems like uh, under uh, uh, the DV Act itself, we have protection officers. So one panel protection officer is also present there. Now over there, though uh, in a city, in a huge city like Bangalore, you have uh, several jurisdictions, you have different, different police station. Still a survivor of sexual assault or even domestic violence, a woman can go there to this Nirbaya Sakhi Center. And she can, get, it is like a one-stop shop, you know, wherein you get all kinds of help and support there, even shelter for uh, certain yes, women yes. who are in I, I, I want to explain about yeah. uh, what is happening in Telangana. Yeah. Telangana, we, uh, we are having support centers, what you said is the correct. So we have two uh, counselors, uh, emergency vehicle is there 24 hours. 24 hours available and 181 is the toll free number. Yeah. Whenever that is uh, national, it, it all over India, to, no? One yeah, all over India and it linked to uh, Saki centers. Yes. So, Bhumika Women's Collective is, is also run, having a helpline since 2006. It, yeah. it is also a toll free number and 24 hours. Correct. So, that is why I, I want to share my experience with police. That's why I came into this. No, no thank, thank you. you. Much for, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah very important. Uh, now, uh, there is a lay crush, crushman. Uh, would you like to speak? You have raised hand. Ma'am, Ma lay. Doctor, then Professor Asha Gala, would you like to speak? You have also raised hand. Yeah, yes. Am Please I audible? Ahead. Yes, you are audible. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah, Doctor Vibhuti, for inviting, and it has been every time very enlightening and little assuring. Also, like okay, I mean, I think for number of personal experiences in the community, family nearby. Um, honestly, I feel there is a greater and greater need to speak up. Like we uh, may be coming from this background or ideology, we do speak up at the conferences, seminars, but in a day-to-day -day life, like, okay, when a woman starts saying that it's all right, when we're sitting in like, okay, in the family gatherings and you somebody says, to you, okay, I was beaten up or my husband said, second is very subtle type of abuses. It could be heavily like taunting or, you know, uh, degrading the woman all the time, abusing in a sense, okay, you're good for nothing. Uh, those type of violences, I think there is a lesser emphasis on that, but that can be very harmful to the women. Yeah. Uh, and um, more so for the uh, educated women as such, support system, who will support? I, I think in the most... Uh, prosperous communities also like I belong to Kachi community where there are crores of rupees being spent for number of uh, noble causes and good work being done but uh, nothing absolutely about issues like domestic violence and where will you get the physical support like where will a woman go and if the parents do not like that's a that's a very very important aspect and I'm glad that many of the resource persons have touched upon it yeah. yeah. All the best from my side, if I could be 
of any uh, i don't know i'm i don't want to say help but in any way associated with any of the initiatives that Good each enough. one of you are doing i would be more than happy to be part yeah. of thank you thank you ashish ji uh, there is a lay are you uh, are you still there kasman and there is a question in the question box by bhumi yadav to dr vijaya lakshmi prara would you like to answer that question that uh, in the northeast women are more liberated and they are it's a women dominated society if that is the kind of impression rest of the india has and daughters have a right to inheritance of property how do you explain a violence against domestic violence yeah hello yeah vijaya lakshmi ji Yes, yes. Yeah, I, was, I, was, yeah. I was saying I'm unmuting myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is the problem. This is exactly the problem. Uh, you know, the women of northeast face. You know, this whole gamut of, uh, you know, visibility of women on the street, uh, visibility of women. Uh, you know, in the in the in the in the, in the during the conflict, uh, and the visibility of uh, you know, for example, in Manipur, we have very strong. women's organization called uh, you know mera pai mera pai you know and then uh, we have uh, mera and then we have uh, you know the whole history of uh, the colonial history of manipur is actually women's history you know the, i think that's the only state we can you can say that there is her story not his story okay so you know we have those kind of very proud uh, you know um, uh, you know matri structures so to say uh, yeah, you know in manipur so much also mahila samitis in assam and then of course because of uh, you know christianity the women came forward and be began in the baby they became part of the christian women's associations in mizoram and all that so uh, at the uh, along with that along with that don't forget that so northeast has been a conflict area for you know 70 years uh, now and now things are becoming you know uh, what you call normalizing and the, the, the more peace and all that but it is only now so uh, the women in northeast have been on the streets trying to protect their sons and their husbands from the uh, uh, from the conflict you know uh, uh, let me not go into the blame game you know uh, with conflict with the state forces the non state and the state forces and uh, so their agenda has not been feminism their agenda has not been looking within their agenda has not been critiquing their society because you know just like any other indigenous feminist movement they are embroiled in the fact that if they critique they become anti national uh so therefore you know peeping that's why when i when i said in the beginning that we have this myth about women's uh, in you know a high status of women in northeast is because there is visibility we don't have fifty side we don't have infanticide we don't have wheels you know and there are women who are in economic sphere we have all women's market called ima kethel so they are handling the economy but at what level you know in the sense that they they still belong to the level uh, of uh, survival you know in the sense that uh, there was a time you know in the in the history of women's market there was a time when uh, the king's uh, you know mother used to sit you know the the uh, even as late as chief minister uh, you know their uh, wives used to sit okay so it was more of a social socio economic kind of interaction kind of uh, space and also slow and, and it was it had a history of political ideology space where this women's collective fought against the british okay so they had that kind of now when you go into the profile of women in uh, women's market in imaketel more than half of them are all uh, single women and because either their husbands have died in the conflict or they have uh, drunk got drunk and died uh and uh, and uh, uh, so they are there uh, out women headed households are in of compulsion not really you know that okay let's go spend time you know like leisure time it's it's no more like that and so therefore you know in uh, uh, we have a very famous economist called janki jain devaki jain she devaki. said in fact the visibility of women on the street it is an indicator of the uh you know the the deprivation of the society rather than you know empowerment of the society per se uh, so we should not go into that kind of you know paradigm into into believing that women even in the matrilineal as uh, madam vibhuti talked about 
even in the matrilineal, I, I'm sorry if I'm taking more time because this is this admit has to be broken, ma'am. You know, in the in the matrilineal system uh, in uh, Khasi society, it is matrilineage. Not it's only lineage, okay, no, from mother no. to daughter to daughter. But in the political sphere, which is called darbar snong, women are not allowed to enter into that physical space, leave alone no. the ideological and any other viewpoint. Yeah, to check it out. So, you know, uh, so and also the, the, the role of um, in the matrilineal system, it is the, the mother's brother who takes over yeah. the role of father. So, ultimately, it is a man. It is not really uh, empowerment and matrilineage has no indication with the empowerment of women. Only thing is that it, it because of these spaces, uh, you know, Ima Kethil, Mera Pai B, then even matrilineages. Mother's association. These kind of, you know, they give us a, a, a little higher baseline. That is, I can agree. That gives no. a higher state uh, baseline because we already have collectivities. We have connected with it. So, but only thing is that direction has to change into the fact that, you know, rather than being organizations only of women, they that need is. to become organization for women. But I think it is their agenda. It is their perspective. We are nobody to patronize them. So they, will, they will come where, uh, you know, over, they, they have been struggling with conflict. Probably now, like Naga Mothers Association has started doing it. You know, they, they fought against their, uh, their menfolk into the fact that they have a right to stand for elections in municipal yeah. councils and Supreme Court also. Uh, uh, Manchati, uh, Raja, uh, yeah, implementation. In the municipal act, ma'am, in municipal act. So similarly, uh, Arunachal, there are a lot of movements now critiquing within, you know, as I talked to you about this whole polygamy and all, all this thing. My Mizoram yeah. also, they're fighting against bright price. They don't want a bright price. You know, so the things Equally are cruel. Equally cruel. Equally cruel like dowry, correct? Yeah. Then they, they, let us not go into the fact that uh, you know not these women have high status. So I think that the patriarchal control is uh, very much there even in the material lineage. No, so that is that comes out very clearly with from your uh, this thing. So instead of a husband or a father-in-law, you have a brother, mama who is controlling the decisions. But it's a very important dimensions that have come up. And now all five, six of you are going to get your wrap up round. But before that, I would like a word of appreciation from Jitendra Alok Prasad Prajapati, who is a research scholar. And he has said he, he has found this uh, session extremely important. And uh, he got a lot of uh, messages and guidance from this. Uh, so that's the one pleasant note with which uh, it has ended. But now all of you, you have your closing remarks and the pathways for future. So we can start with uh, Dr. Kirti. Yeah, with regard to the domestic violence, when we are talking about the challenges and responses, one of the gray area not uh, uh, touched uh, till now is maintenance of the woman in marital discard. During the pandemic, nobody got maintenance for two years. Yes, we have done a pan-India study and getting the information from under RPI from the different ports in India also. So the main recommendation is to bring a change in the section 125 of CRPC, which tells that if the husband don't give the money, then he can, after 12 months, the woman can go to the uh, again to, uh, court and the, he can, uh, the judge can offer whether to go to the jail or to give pay the money. So most of the men are going to jail, not paying the money. So the basic right of the woman of living is foregoing, which is the fundamental right of the woman. That is one thing. And also there is no, uh, we have to create a national registry of domestic abusers and offenders in India, which is not in India. And also we have to streamline of aluminium or interior maintenance and final settlement of the procedure. And also the monitoring system to track the maintenance case should be created by police department at each police unit. And think out of box solution is a fund to be created by government of India to support women fighting the maintenance cases because it is not going in the time bomb nature and it's going years together and women are missing it. And one more new initiative which we have taken up, which we all can see it in the Play Store is, we have designed an 
tech tool that is uh, uh, evidence valid for women. That is, I'm just keeping in the chat box also, that is available in the Play Store. That is going to address because 92 to 93 percent of the women going to the courts are unable to produce their evidences, although they have smartphones and they are recording the voices. So that's why this is going to be a cloud space for the women with all confidentiality that they can have a password at a primary level we did it and we are going with a, a more uh, most robust one with a facial recognition also once we have some more funding and all those things so here i would like to thank everyone that the initiatives and challenges are there but we all have to work with much more patience, much more innovation, and to make the political agenda for the next elections is how do we make the women to be more dignity and respect? The politicians will see it. There, I'll conclude and thank you so much for Vibhuti and everyone making me to be a part of it. Thank yeah. you so much. Yes, Dr. Tara Nair. What would you like to, what will be your final words? Yeah. No, I have very little to say. One thing I would say that, uh, you know, like, uh, I still believe that we need to reinvent the transformative potential of many of these initiatives that you are talking about. Uh, some of them, I think, have really been transformed into very transactional sort of models and pedagogies and all that. So I think we need to really uh, get back that, uh, you know, a very feminist reflexive uh, sort of, you know, uh, dialogue and, you know, like women should be made to critically reflect on their objective life situations, not like, not a, a kind of a response after uh, an event happens would not uh, be the, a lot of energies are spent there, but I think we need to really proactively do something. Uh, I also think that, trans uh, you know, women, uh, men's perspective about, uh, you know, violence and uh, violence against women must be really worked on uh, with much greater sort of, uh, you know, seriousness. Uh, and uh, and I, I, of course, many of us said that I, I really do not personally think that, uh, you know, only, uh, you know, uh, legal and uh, procedural reforms would uh, make any uh, long lasting sustainable change in this, uh, you know, in this, this, this particular phenomenon. Uh, you know, women in India, it's very clear that they are not receiving any social support. This is despite the fact that they choose partners of their family's choice and they, uh, you know, from their own caste and community or all that is done and their bodies become, uh, you know, uh, you know, they, their bodies bear the burden of representing or reproducing caste and community and privilege and all that. So they are just seen as those bodies which, uh, you know, recreates and reproduces that kind of, you know, caste and community privilege system unless and until we do something very drastic uh, to uh, you know, create a social transformation around changing uh, these kinds of notions. I think uh, we are definitely not going to be very far. Thank you so much. I'm thank you. Sorry thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Now, Dr. Celine, uh, Advocate Celine, what are your concluding remarks? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I do. Um, you know, there is a one uh, thought process that has been resonating again and again from the participants as well as from the panelists. It is about uh, the patriarchal system. See, uh, patriarchy, according to me, it does not just uh, proliferate and exist only because men want it. But women, certain women are benefiting from it and therefore they quietly support it. So what, I, uh, what I'd like to say over here in the light, in the context of this background, there are a few challenges which I believe that uh, it's not just for an advocate to address, but this, this invariably comes to an advocate because the survivor has approached the advocate for redress. So I would just like to read them out. Leaving and abusing of husband is not a simple matter for most of the women. Uh, who will financially support me is the first question they ask. Who will financially support my kids, especially their education? Uh, support with respect to simple things like bank related matter. I know qualified engineers and qualified doctors who do not know what is happening with their bank account. Okay, so a lack of confidence in doing anything on their own. Now here it is not just because they have given everything to their husband. It is also because these women 
whether they are qualified or not, literate or not, whatever it is, they've been brought up that way. The institution in which they were raised, their parents, they have brought them that way, which is uh, kind of disabling them on various levels, disabling them to take strong financial decisions on their own, disabling them from taking any decision with respect to, I'm not going to support, I'm not going to take uh, any more abuse anymore. So the self-esteem, the self-respect and sense of self-worth, none of these are inculcated in any of these women because they are, they are suffering challenges on those levels as well when they approach a lawyer. Also, in addition to that, the emotional anchorage is sought from a lawyer. A lot of these women in distress when they approach a lawyer, they are seeking, they heavily lean on their lawyer for all these things. A lot of them are unwilling to go and get professional help in terms of getting counseling or any other kind of mental or emotional support from a qualified professional. So I guess some amount of awareness needs to be created from that perspective as well. A lot of women, when they uh, approach, when their matter is already, uh, you know, uh, taken by the police and FIR has been lodged, there is a case, there's a criminal case in court. And also if they are seeking maintenance and have filed several cases under Domestic Violence Act, Family Court and all those things, they are usually very short-sighted. They're constantly worried about how much we're going to pay while the husband, he's willing to drop an entire arsenal on top of their head with respect to, you know, going through, uh, you know, using every legal machinery that is available in place to ensure that the woman cannot fight anymore. So I guess uh, what we, these are the challenges that I am dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of them I do find answers to, but a lot of them, I think they need to be addressed uh, and if it's possible to be addressed uh, through community-based organization by creating awareness, and nothing like it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Dr. Advocacy. Now, uh, another lawyer, uh, Advocate Gayatri Sharma, what, what, what are your final words? So I'm going to go completely the non-legal uh, way. I, I, for me, I think um, for, for a long time, we've been discussing dowry, uh, a beating of uh, the, uh, physical forms of uh, domestic violence uh, with, uh, of married women, uh, child care. But uh, the Shraddha Walker case really opened uh, my eyes to uh, domestic violence against um, women who are in intimate relationships and domestic violence within the natal family. And the reason why I'm saying it's moving away from the law is because it's not easy to use the law against your parents. And even the CJI said very recently that hundreds of uh, people are killed every year in India because they choose to exercise who they want to marry. And parents don't agree with that choice. On a so crime. How, crime how, how do we, uh, how can we bring awareness that the natal family is also a perpetrator of violence? Uh, how do we bring about that uh, awareness? I think the solution is not really legal. Uh, there has to, uh, 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 one component would be the law, but more than that, uh, working with the youth, working with young people, um, making sure that they don't lack the courage in saying that this is wrong and I don't, uh, I will not tolerate this. Um, and, al and also support each other because they have seen that wherever, even in intercaste, interreligious marriages, where there has been support, then they have been able to survive. No, so absolutely. that is very important. Only absolutely. when they are isolated, then the Kapanchayat or parents or this, they, they uh, do the custodial killing. Yeah, very important. Yes. And now, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Brara, your final words. Yeah. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So, as I said, that the terminologies have to change uh, from victim to survivor. Then appearances need to be, you know, not judged. Uh, in the sense, you know, why, 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 why should we, uh, that the doctors and all, notice on the fact that what she was wearing and how she looks and whether she can speak or she's subdued, you know? So when you're subdued, so you fall into the whole matrix of patriarchy where you say, okay, this girl can be abused, you know? But if you can't speak that this girl can't be abused, that kind of judgmental, uh, you know, uh, thing has to go. And that can only go when we have structural changes. I know it is a very, very ideological academic way of saying it, I accept that fact, but then we have no choice. We have no choice in the sense structural, the patriarchal structure uh, needs to, if it cannot change, it needs to dilute. It, you know, I know it cannot change. It's, it's a centuries old, 
but somewhere uh, you know we have to puncture the you know the balloon and uh, we are so so that is because the 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 willingness to affirm to this whole power equation is so strong that even an educated person like me would be like to be called oh she's a good wife you know she doesn't you know any but any woman like for example you know sometimes say oh you know yeah the, you know when i when i go there okay go there but don't talk that much okay you know even to me you know at this <laughs> age you know i have been patronized i am patronized by you know people into saying that zyada baat mat karna you know yeah, don't be so political you know so you know this so imagine young budding you know women you know right. learning what will be their condition so uh, that patriarchal bubble has to be bursted uh, very important yeah. you know you know and that goes uh, you know across regions across countries be it northeast be it africa be it rajasthan be it anywhere you know it it is a world because you see i mean what is happening in iran you know i, I mean uh, the whole movement against it. what is happening in america i mean the 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 law which says that you cannot <laughs> abort where are we heading abort, to yeah. where are we heading to today right. so globally we america, see this kind of a wave and that yeah. the yeah, domestic yeah. violence coming backlash in, the uh, backlash that we are facing depression you know so uh, we yeah. have a long we have a long way to go thank you very much yeah yes yeah thank you all the panelists you have uh, made a extremely important statement and what emerged from today's discussion is that why there are one aspect which is left out is that while serious health consequences of domestic violence for women are well researched and established the role of public health system in responding to the issues that are not received uh, adequate attention and in case of domestic violence it is imperative to document both the recent episodes of violence as well as the women's history of violence uh, because such documentation is critical uh, in case of uh, having access to justice and uh, most often women decide to seek legal action only after violence has escalated but they are not document there are no documentary evidence to prove that and there is a need for an affirmative action to protect girls women young women and elderly women from domestic violence and establish uh, human rights for them for which what we need is one improve women's economic capabilities i think it came uh, very clearly from the study of dr tara nair strengthen and expand training and sensitization program advocate gayatri uh, sharma she emphasized that the lasa model of one stop crisis center different states have a different dilasa is a hospital based uh, uh, one stop crisis center for the survivor of violence so that she doesn't have to run from pillar to post from a criminal justice system to shelter home to for counseling or for for child uh, care so he, all services are converged to this uh, casualty ward of the hospital while in andhra pradesh they have a community based uh, one stop crisis center uh effective use of media to build public awareness is extremely important to have a campaign of zero tolerance to violence and that to be uh, it should be done with an interdisciplinary perspective where the mental health physical health and the dignity and uh, well being are emphasized programs for, to design for the batterers i think there there are many countries who have done that south africa has done it many several asian countries like malaysia philippines they have also had program for the batterer uh, that how uh, the anger management uh, that is a, that is the work some ngos are also doing and addressing domestic violence through education i think that was also emphasized that this kind of a education about women's dignity or the uh, respectful relationship with between different genders has to be uh, taught at a very early age so prevent of domestic violence ultimately depends upon changing the norms of society regarding violence as a means of conflict resolution and the traditional attitude about gender so to achieve this there must be introduction of gender and human rights in curricula of schools universities professional colleges workers education program 
and also the training teachers training colleges so uh, along with this uh, there must be recognition and commitment to the principles of free and compulsory and uh, primary and secondary education for girls and boys so that they know about their rights and also the some of the customs like uh, most of the studies have shown that the uh, in cases of child marriages uh, violence is very high and they are totally powerless so i think that some of the, the campaign against child marriage is also equally important so i think the kind of approach which women power connect has taken that it is not seeing domestic violence in isolation and all of you have also emphasized that so thank you very much and now i request zubia for the conclusion of the program thank you ma'am as we come to the end of this extremely enlightening discussion i zubia researcher at infri impact and policy research institute new delhi would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the impri gender impact studies center we'd like to express our gratitude to the panelists for today's session advocate gayatri sharma professor vijay lakshmi brara dr tara nair advocate selin thomas dr kirti bolineni and anchita ghatak ma'am for taking out their precious time to share their views adding their diverse perspectives and valuable insights to the deliberation on the important topic we are grateful to professor vibhuti patel for chairing and leading the talk and of course we thank all our participants here on zoom or on facebook live for participating and raising pertinent questions we are grateful if you are watching us later on youtube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications i hope that you continue to tune in future to our state of gender equality hashtag #gender gap series and impri web policy talks thank you once again and i wish you all a very good evening thank you 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 very much bye bye